have a normal development, so nothing that really would make you think that they have a metabolic disorder and all of a sudden at the age of one, two, three or even later on they develop this sort of you know, um, age-related epilepsy which is done by absences. Fellow Homo sapiens, my name is Tori Robinson and welcome to, welcome back to Epilepsy Sparks Insights. Now if I say glute, what do you think of? Would you think of one's rear or of gluten? Well, in this case, we are talking about glucose, often referred to casually as sugar or a form of energy. Actually though, the molecule glucose is actually a mix of six atoms of carbon, 12 of hydrogen and six of oxygen. And it is crucial for our survival. And if somebody happens to have a genetic mutation that restricts the absorption to our brains, then we have a severe problem. In fact, we have a rare genetic type of epilepsy called GLUT1 deficiency disorder. I am delighted to be chatting today with the director of the Child Neurology and Psychiatric Unit at Salisi Children's Hospital, neuropsychiatrist Carla Marini. Please don't forget to share your thoughts on this episode with us in the comments below. I really enjoy reading your comments and your thoughts and responding to them. Do subscribe so that we can educate and empower way more people affected by the epilepsies around the world and indeed more clinicians with patients who have an epilepsy to provide the best care possible. I am a child neurologist and neuropsychiatrist. I'm currently working in Ancona, Italy. And um, in my career, I went through the university in Bologna and then I lived in Melbourne and worked with Sam and Ingrid, uh, uh, Sam Berkowitz and English chef for, for um, several years where I did a PhD on clinical genetics. Um, and I actually trained as an adult neurologist to start with because I was so interested in genetics then I decided to train also to become a pediatric uh, epileptologist and neurologist. Um, came back to Italy and um, I landed in Pisa with Renzo Gurrini who I work with for nearly 20 years. Uh, first of all in Pisa uh, and then in Florence at the Mayer Hospital where I was until four years ago. And here I am directing the Child Neurology and Psychiatric Unit in Ancona, so um, starting this new adventure. Fantastic. We're going to talk a little bit specifically about the GLUT1 disorder, a type of epilepsy, which um, I, don't, I don't know, but maybe this is my experience. I say GLUT1 and people think, oh, gluten or, uh, um, or, or protein or ketogenic diet. Uh, what, what, is, what is GLUT1? GLUT1 is actually a metabolic disorder with neurological symptoms. Uh, predominantly epilepsy, but not only. Um, it's caused by the lack of glucose in the brain. Uh, so there's nothing to do with gluten, but it has to do with glucose. So the sugar cannot be transported into the brain. So the brain lacking sugar can't work properly because the glucose is the uh, fuel for the brain. And so the brain is actually really working very slow or inappropriately. And it is a genetic condition. It's actually caused by genetic mutations in this gene that we, we called um, GLUT1 gene. But it's actually called SCL, uh, SCLA2 uh, one gene, so uh, so that's the proper name. But let's call it GLUT1. So this mutation actually uh, impact on the on the function of the protein that should uh, really shift, uh, you know, transfer the the sugar into the brain, and uh, so it's not working properly. So the, the patient uh, or patients with GLUT1 deficiency have symptoms very early on. Uh, normally from really infancy, early infancy, the few months of life and can be epilepsy to start with, uh, but it also will eventually have some learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities and also eventually movement disorders because the, the, the brain doesn't have enough fuel to you know make the body move properly or develop i presume as well yeah or, and develop properly yes exactly and um these are the main symptoms so related to epilepsy intellectual disability and um and and seizures and movement disorders yeah this type of epilepsy how common is it and is it a de novo mutation or is it um one that is passed down from mum and dad it's actually uh, fortunately quite rare. Um, for instance, in Italy, we created a national registry for the disease. So it's a 
collaborating work with um, several centers throughout Italy and the Familial Association of Group 1. They've done a great uh, work and collaborating with them has been fantastic and we are still collaborating. And in this national registry, we have about 70 patients, but I'm sure not all patients were diagnosed properly. So there may be more, maybe 100, maybe 150, but that would be more or less the number we have in Italy. So as you can understand, it's a rare condition. Uh, and it is inherited uh, uh, in a small proportion of um, patients or so passed on through families. And normally the parent transmitting the disease is very mild or can be even, even uh, non-symptomatic. So it can be a, just a carrier, we say, healthy carrier. And, uh, but most of the mutations could be actually de novo, so occurring during uh, early phase of uh, after the conception and in the, you know, in the fetus's phase, yeah. So what benefits does having a registry for well, any rare disease, but in this case, of course, GLUT1, what does that bring and what's the value of working with, a, you know, with patient groups or, or family groups and organisations? There are several uh, uh, benefits. Uh, I mean, first of all is, you know, working very close to, with the family, you start to get to know them uh, better. Uh, you get all the information from the patients and from the parents and they really are very important in understanding how these uh, disorders and diseases work because they observe their children every day, 24 hours a day, so they can tell you exactly what the symptoms are, what the reactions are and uh, so it's very important to understand the clinical manifestations of the disease. The, the, the registry is very important to understand the natural history of the disease and the disorder because we have patients that have just uh, um, uh, had the symptoms, so the uh, very little, but we also have patients that are maybe 10, 20, 30, and we can see how they are after 10, 20, 30 years of, uh, of the disorder. So we have this, uh, this um, understanding of the natural history and the evolution of the disorder, which is really important for the problem diagnostic features and for the outcome uh, of the of the disease and uh, so that's quite important. It is amazing really how and because I I mean I know lots of people especially researchers do know that if you have um, what on paper looks like the same genetic diagnosis that can affect um, people very differently and to not know that you know that you have this um, rare genetic disease is just pretty pretty amazing and it makes me think how many more people would have not just glute one but any type of um rare disease yeah you're uh, absolutely right uh, uh, this is still one of the part, partly one of the mysteries of the genetic conditions because we know that uh, uh, the same mutation in different genes including lut one can cause a severe phenotype and in some patients and others can have a very very mild phenotype and so definitely i think uh, it might be the influence of the rest of the genetic background which you know really must do something you know it's completely the patient has the same mutation but a completely different genetic background and so the reaction of the body and the rest of the of the of the um, of the DNA and the genes that react differently and um, I think for GLUT1 um, it's important even the type of mutation some mutations can cause a very very mild uh, deficit in the transportation of the glucose through the into the brain and so this means that the patient has some um, glucose into the brain therefore the brain works better and the symptoms can be really mild whereas other patients have mutations that cause a complete lack of transport of glucose to the brain and then the symptoms as you can understand is much worse so there is a correlation between the genotype, what we say, so the genetics and the phenotype, which is the clinical manifestation. And we can also see it from the lumbar puncture because these patients, uh, we normally do a lumbar puncture and we see that uh, the, uh, the glucose, the glycorrhachia is, uh, um, so the level of uh, glucose in the, in the brain is uh, um, affected differently in these patients. So after the genetic uh, study, we normally, we can do a, a lumbar puncture and measure the quantity of glucose in the brain. And I will provide a link to also to um, your paper below, so anyone can check this paper out. Have there been any like unexpected discoveries that you have 
made through working with the patient group, family group. What we discovered actually that was quite some time ago is that some patients can have a very, very mild epilepsy, like for instance, just the absence epilepsy that we think is called the most common type of epilepsy in children. They have a normal development, so nothing that really would make you think that they have a metabolic disorder and all of a sudden at the age of one, two, three, or even later on, they develop this sort of you know, um, age-related epilepsy, which is done by absences, uh, and they can have a metabolic disorder, including GLUT1 deficiency. So that was quite uh, uh, important uh, to uncover those patients that, as you said, can be hidden away because this, the symptoms are so mild that you would never think that they have a metabolic disorder, including GLUT1, and you don't treat them uh, with the ketogenic diet, which is the treatment for GLUT1, uh, because you wouldn't think that they will just have absence, absence epilepsy. So we did um, this paper and we did a publication together with English Sheffer and Sam Berkovic and Renzo and a few others on the early onset absence epilepsy as a uh, phenotype related to GLUT1 deficiency, which was quite interesting. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's something that everyone should keep in mind that even the so-called, uh, you know, absence epilepsies can be related to GLUT1 deficiency. And, and can worsen as the, as the child gets older? They don't uh, particularly worsen. Maybe uh, they're not uh, controlled by the current uh, common anti-epileptic medications we use because they may be, maybe they would need the ketogenic diet, as I said. Why, why is the ketogenic diet used for this? Is it because, is, you know, are we talking about mitochondria and, you know, and ketones and things like that? The ketone bodies actually are very important uh, because they can be transferred into the brain using a different metabolic way, which is not the common one, not the same as glucose. And so then they can be used as a fuel for the brain instead of the glucose that is not there. So uh, that's a reason. It's an alternative metabolic way. So this hypoglycorrhachia uh, is bypassed by using the ketone bodies. So. And does this tend to be what might call, one might call it effective? Like does it control seizures generally in people? It does. It controls seizures. It controls the uh, movement disorder problem. And also we have seen patients improving, especially if the treatment is started really, really early on. They can improve the cognition, uh, the movement, uh, and the intellectual disability. Uh, I think uh, GLUT1 deficiency should be considered one of these treatable conditions and treatable metabolic disorders that if it is diagnosed really early on, possibly even really postnatal, uh, natal and, um, and the treatment is started really early on, the symptoms can be prevented on this precision medicine treatment. Wow, well, yes, precision medicine. Gosh, uh, whenever anybody says precision me medicine, it always makes me think of Rike Mola. We think about Rike quite often, and uh, yeah, even in this case, because we, we published something on GLUT1 as well. Yes, so this is definitely a preventing um, treatable metabolic disorder that should be really thought about it very early on because the, the, the treatment, which is the ketogenic diet, is a replacement treatment. It's not curing the disease, but, you know, we can actually bypass the metabolic um, uh, problem and the metabolic disorder and then can really... I have got a patient and I really think about her great Greta. We diagnosed Greta when she was one. She went on the ketogenic diet and she now lives in Germany because she thinks that uh, Germany is a better country for a uh, ketogenic diet. <laughs> and anyway, so the family moved there and now she is uh, fantastic. She studies languages, she speaks uh, uh, English, Italian, German, and she wants to, you know, she's doing great and she's a, an absolute success, yeah. Thank you so much to Carla for educating us on the complexities of GLUT1 deficiency disorder and sharing with us the value of working with families to obtain an improved understanding of what they experience and how they can best be helped. Do check out Carla's papers and more about her work on the website toryrobinson.com where you can also access the podcast, the video and the transcription of this episode. And if you haven't already, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our channel. Share this episode with your friends, colleagues, family members and see you next week.